Kim, and what a wonderful song. We want the Lord to open our hearts, our minds, our eyes tonight as we look in His Word. Would you take your Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Psalm, excuse me, the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. We are going to go to Psalms in a minute. I got Psalms on my mind, but we're going to start in Ephesians. Ephesians 5, we're going to read verses 18 down through verse number 21. Let's stand together and we'll read those verses. We're talking tonight about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And this, music, this message tonight is primarily on music. What part music plays in worship? What part music plays in your individual life of worship? What part music plays in the worship of God's people in church? Ephesians 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your place there and just turn over a few pages to Colossians. The book of Colossians, chapter 3, and look at verse number 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You may be seated. Let me ask you a question tonight. What do you think is the most controversial subject in all of Christianity today? The most controversial subject. Is it ordaining women into the ministry? Is it homosexuality? Is it abortion? Is the most controversial subject in Christianity today stem cell research? Is it relaxing of standards or convictions? Is it whether or not a person can lose their salvation? No. According to those who do surveys, 100% of those who took polls said that the most controversial subject in Christianity today is music style. And it's role in worship music style let me say at the very beginning and let's get this over with all right music and worship are not synonymous there are those who think if you sing a certain kind of music God's going to come down if you sing this kind of music God's going to come down that worship is music and music is worship no music is only a part of worship Worship is the entire, your entire being, your entire lifestyle. You worship God in your prayers. You worship God through the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. You worship God through your giving. And you worship God as well through music. But when you study the Word of God, you do find that the number one expression of worship toward God is music. Because there's no such thing as a Christian without a song. The Bible says in Psalm 40, verse number 2, He picked me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, established my goings, put a new song in my heart, even praise under our God. Many shall see it in fear and trust in the Lord. So when you became a new creature in Christ Jesus, you got a brand new song. See, all of heaven sang when you got saved. You know that? The Bible says there's rejoicing and praise in the presence of the angels when you get saved. They worship in heaven when somebody gets saved. So there's a, there's a song in heaven when you get saved. There's also a song in your heart when you get saved. I was thinking about that when you're saved, you're a new creation and you get a, a new song. Do you know that when God made the world, there was a song? Over in the book of Job, don't turn there, but in Job, in chapter 38, when God was just telling Job, you weren't there when I made the world. And if you had have been there when I made the world, you're not so smart as you think you are, Job, is what God was telling him. And God said to him, Job, if you'd have been there, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. At the creation of the universe, there was singing and there was shouting and there was praise and there was worship there. I mean, how how could there not be when there was such a beautiful creation? God spoke and said, let there be light. And he spoke the world into existence and the angels and the stars sang for joy. And then you, when you and I were saved to become a new creation in Christ, there was song. Can you think this evening, how could we worship God without singing? How could we endure life without having a song? I don't know if you watch the news like I do. When the cities of Afghanistan were liberated from the Taliban, what was the first thing those people did? 
They got out their instruments and they played music and they sang, which had been forbidden, but they'd been set free, then been liberated, and there was song. Now, for those of you who are too are bent too serious for music or instruments, the fact remains that there are 575 references to singing and praise in the Bible. At the very core of the Bible, there is a song book of 150 different songs known as the Psalms. Music's in the Bible. Singing's in the Bible. It's there. And if you're too serious for it, don't deny those of us who aren't. Amen. We want to sing and praise the Lord. God made creation and gave a bird a song. God gave a whale a song. God gave Eddie Bumpers a song. He can't, you say, well, the Bible says make a joyful noise. I got the noise part down. The joyful part, I'm not too sure yet. I, I kind of sound like a wounded, a, a wounded moose or something when I sing. But the, 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 <laughs> my song is not for you. My song is for him. He's given me a unique voice. Nobody's got a voice like mine. And he wants to hear me lift up my voice and sing to him. And I'm made in the image of God. And only human beings have the intelligence to use pitch and tone and harmony to focus their praise to God. How did Mary respond when the angel came to her and said, here's the news. You're going to have a son, and it's going to be the son of God. What did Mary do? Luke 1, 46 through 40, 55 says, she sang, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and she sang a song. When Paul and Silas were down there in that Philippian jail, in maximum, maximum security, what did they do? They sang down the glory, amen, and the place shook and they were set free. Acts 16, 25 says they sang praises under our God. By the way, I've read all through the New Testament, and Brother Mark, I, I found something. I never find the Pharisees having a sing-along. <laughs> it's not in there. What is one of the activities we're going to have in heaven? Now, we know there's going to be some great things we're going to do in heaven. One thing we're absolutely sure of, we're going to do in heaven, sing praise to God. I'm looking forward to getting a new body, and I hope a new set of vocal cords to go along with that new body where I can sing. You never heard. I think I'm going to be able to sing better in heaven than anybody else because the last shall be first. Amen. Being you, brother, know we're going to do a, get together and sing a, a, a duet. Amen. When we get to glory. Someone said this. You cannot imagine hell with a song. And you cannot imagine heaven without a song. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, a great throng of people around the throne were singing, worthy is the Lamb that received honor and glory and blessings and praise forever and ever. And they sang that song of praise to the Lord. John Newton, another John, not the John on the Isle of Patmos, but another John, put it down in his hymn that he wrote for us. Page 333 in your hymnal. And that is amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When we've been there 10,000 years bright, shining as the sun, we'll no less days to sing God's praise than when we just begun. The highest expression of praise that you and I can express to God is singing to the Lord. Someone said this, a picture is worth a thousand words. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, maybe a song is worth 10,000 words. Because, if you ever thought about this, that your singing, the music in your life, is a leading indicator of your spiritual life and your spiritual temperature. It's true about David. When David wrote the songbook, Sometimes he finished his song and gave it to the song leader Asaph. And he said, this is to be sung on the high sounding cymbal. It means blare it out. It's a song of joy. Just like I did right there on the microphone. It's a, sing it loud. Sing it strong. It's a song of joy. Then sometimes those songs were mellow, low key. Coming out of uh, being a fugitive in the wilderness. And just kind of showed you the temperature that was in his life. It captured the state of mind that David was in. When Saul was... Oppressed with demons, the Bible said David played upon his harp and those evil spirits had to leave. I can imagine him sitting out there on those hillsides watching those sheep looking at the stars and singing praise to God when he was lonely or discouraged. He sang those songs. Oh, tonight, in the child of God, there ought to be a song. 
There ought to be joy in your life. Jesus has saved you and there ought to be song. See, God's people have always been a singing people. Now, we don't know how they sang in the early church. You say, I know how they sang. They sang Amazing Grace. They sang out of the hymn book. You don't know that. <laughs> they didn't even have one then. I'm going to show you that in a minute. We don't know how the Jerusalem church sang or the Antioch church sang. And by the way, the singing we do in this church bears very little resemblance to the singing they do in India. Or the singing in Belarus or in Asia or Africa. Those people have a song and they sing their song to God. Amen, brother. Different than we sing our song to the Lord. We ought to get us a choir from over there, brother. They'd show us how to sing. What matters in your singing is your heart. It's your heart. Robert Ingersoll, who was an infamous atheist, left explicit instructions at his funeral. He said, there will be no singing at my funeral. He was an atheist. He didn't believe God was on the throne. And if God's not upon the throne, there's very little to sing about. I got news for you. God is on the throne, and there's a whole lot to sing about. Amen. There's that old song that says, have faith in God. He's on the throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He must not fail. He must prevail. Have faith. Have faith in God. Now, John Wesley said something that I think is really good about singing. He said this. Some of you need to hear this. Are you ready? I'm ready. You ready? Listen to this. He said, beware of singing as if you're half dead or half asleep. He said, lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now or more ashamed of it being heard than when you sang the songs of Satan. Sing loud. That's what he said. He said, but I can't sing. Well, you're not singing for me. You're singing for God, and God thinks you can sing, so sing for him. By the way, <laughs> the joyful noise is not determined by your ability. It's determined by your heart, and God wants to hear your heart when you sing and when you worship him. You say, well, preacher, I don't have no problem with singing. That's not the problem. I, I love singing. I have no problem with singing. What I have a problem with is some of the singing we do today. You don't rush me. I'm going to get there in just a second. <laughs> it, wouldn't it be better to have songs of, of worship and praise on your lips when you enter the week than some jingle from some commercial on TV? you got to face the devil, to face a hard job, face difficulty. You ought to have a good song on your lip to combat all the things in this world. And by the way, every single one of us have a lot to, to sing about. We have plenty to praise about, plenty to sing about. Notice back in our scripture, let me show you three reasons real quick. Three things we have to sing about in several ways we can sing. Reason number one, Eddie Bumper can sing and you can sing is because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. The second reason we can sing is because we got the Word of God in our heart. And the third reason we can sing is we got a lot to be thankful about. He says every bit of it right here is Thanksgiving season and we sing, he says, with Thanksgiving. Notice what he says in verse number 18. Be filled with the Spirit. Now there have been people who have given all kinds of odd and strange uh, 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 philosophies of what it's like to be full of the people of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to debate those. But I'm going to tell you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there'll be joy in your heart and a song in your life. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't even put a period there. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And goes right on to say, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you're spirit-filled and spirit-controlled, you'll want to sing. When the Holy Spirit is in your life, you'll want to sing. You'll sing in your car. You'll sing in the shower. You'll sing. Think about it. The Holy Ghost of God lives in me. My body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm one of his children. I can never get lost. I'm eternally saved. i got the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Therefore, I've got a song. I can sing. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul said, I will sing with the Spirit. When I'm saved and sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I'm a child of God. And when the Holy Spirit's in, in control of my life, there's not sadness and moaning and groaning. There's joy in my heart. I've been forgiven. I've been saved. Holy Spirit lives in me. I got a song. Martin Luther said this one time. The devil hates God's music because he can't stand gaiety. In our day, that would be joy. He said Satan can smirk, but he can't laugh. He can sneer, but he can't sing. You know, one of my favorite psalms 
is Psalm 126, verse number 2 says, When the heathen came out of captivity, it says they were marching and laughing up to Mount Zion. And the Bible says the heathen said the Lord had done great things for them. And they answered back and said, yes, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. And they were going to God's house laughing and singing and having a good time. Now, if you were an outsider looking at a new group of people or a new church, what would attract you to that group? I think what would attract me would be that they have laughter. They have joy. They have a song. They're not just a bunch of bad desire pussies. They have a good time. They're the family of God, and they even like each other, and they even sing together, and they worship together. It's a good thing. Uplifting our hearts in singing and praise affects people. Therefore, the devil doesn't want us to be joyful and singing and praising. He likes to stifle us down and beat us down. You say, preacher, I'm worried about us getting too charismatic. Don't worry about that. We're along with them getting too charismatic. Don't, 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 don't even get worried about that. And by the way, I don't even know what, I don't know what charismatic means. But listen to me. Look up at me. They were lifting up their hands. They were clapping. They were shouting for joy. They were playing instruments and singing before the word charismatic ever came along. So call us biblical. Biblical. Biblical, not charismatic, biblical. And listen, by the way, we're living in a lost and lonely and hurting world, and they can't resist genuine joy from the Holy Ghost inside of our heart. I've got to hurry. Second reason we can sing, only we sing because we're filled with the Spirit. We sing because we're, we're, to be, we're filled with the, with the Scripture. Did you see that verse over in Colossians? It's almost a mirror verse of Ephesians. It says a little bit different. It adds a little bit of significance uh, because it says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom in verse number 16. When you're filled with the Word of God, you have joy in your heart. Most of our hymns were written by people who got in the Word, and the Word got in them, and a the song came forth. When the word gets in you and you get in the word, amen, a song for praise comes forth from the Lord. We sing a third reason. We sing not only because we have the Holy Spirit. We sing because we have the scripture in our life. We sing because we're satisfied. You know, covetous, greedy people don't sing. Because they don't have any joy. They're not satisfied. They're not, they're not happy. So their song is gone because they're pouting and they're looking at somebody. Say, Why does he have that job? Why does he have that house? Why do they have that money? Listen, you ought to be thankful for what you do have. And when you think about the fact that you have a lot more than a lot of people have, that should get joy, put joy in your life. And you should be singing and praising God for your house, for your car, for your wife, for your kids, for your church, for God's blessings on you. Don't just walk around thinking about what you don't have. Walk around singing and praising God for what you do have. He said right there in that verse that we sing both places, Ephesians and the book of Colossians. He says, giving thanks in verse 20 of Ephesians 5, giving thanks always for all things. Unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, all right, preacher. I sing because I'm filled with the Spirit. I sing when I'm full, filled with the Scripture. I sing when I'm filled with satisfaction. And I can say amen to all of that. The controversy comes up when we debate the style of music that we use to sing to the Lord. What kind of music is fit for worship? Should we sing old hymns? Should we sing new songs? Should we sing praise courses? Should we sing directly from the Scripture? Should we sing directly from the New Testament? Should we sing from the Old Testament? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you notice in that verse he said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, that's the issue, to the Lord. That little word and is significant. It is a word that speaks of diversity. Diversity. Not just one, but all three of them Paul put there. The scripture doesn't limit us, and we shouldn't limit ourselves. Jesus doesn't limit us, we shouldn't limit ourselves. We can sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That covers it all. Now, what is, let's talk about these, in, these uh, specifically. What is a psalm? Well, the psalm, of course, is a song from the psalm book. We sing from the Psalms. 
Jesus knew the Psalms. Jesus sang from the Psalms. When Jesus' family traveled to the temple three times a year, uh, they sang from the Psalms. That's what they have. That was their song book. And they sang from the Psalms. Then there are hymns. Hymns were the new forms of music. There were new forms of music that was expression that bursted out of the hearts of those grateful early believers when they got saved. Nearly all biblical scholars agree that Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11 was a, uh, a beautiful example of an early Christian hymn. Along with Revelation 4 was an early Christian hymn. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the last part of that, they say was an early Christian hymn. Hymns, hymns have been used by God, I don't know, more than in, 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 in our generation have been used by God in a great way. Hymns summarize crucial Christian doctrines. They kind of crystallize that. Some of you are reading other places in the Bible right now because I mentioned some verses of Scripture. Come on back and come on back and join me. <laughs> Do you know that we have not stopped writing hymns throughout Christian history? Well, the Mark's going to talk about that in just a few moments, but he's going to talk a minute about Fanny Crosby. She wrote 2,000 at least. Charles Wesley wrote 8,000. They're not all in your hymn book. Some didn't last. Some hymns didn't last. Some hymns didn't make it. Some hymns had 16 verses. Some hymns had some pretty rough, crude language in them that we're, we don't sing today. John Newton, that slave trader, was a great hymn writer, and he wrote more than just Amazing Grace. You got a, you got a hymn book. I don't even have a hymn. Yeah, I got that hymn book. Who's got a hymn, you got a hymn book? Give me a hymn book. Hymn book. Turn in your hymn book to the front page, the introduction area of your hymn book. I want to introduce you to somebody we have a lot to be grateful to this guy about. Introduction, page, uh, uh, Roman numeral 6. They mentioned a guy in there that pastored Horsley Down Baptist Church, the first part of that in London in 1690. This guy, Benjamin Keach, was a Baptist. He pastored particular Baptist church in, in London, England, 1690. The issue in 1690 was whether we should allow him singing in the church at all. The Baptists did not believe in congregational singing. You know why? They said, man, that, that's contemporary stuff. It's men's compositions. Men wrote it. It's not straight from the Psalms. It's not straight from the Bible. It's men's compositions, and we shouldn't sing it. They said we should sing Scripture, but we shouldn't sing hymns. Not that contemporary stuff. Well, Robert Keach led his church in singing hymns. Matter of fact, Robert Keach wrote most all the hymns that his church sang. He wrote them, and his church sang them. There was a guy in his church that didn't like hymns. So he came up against Robert Keach. His name was Isaac Marlowe. And Isaac Marlowe made a big deal about singing hymns. Matter of fact, he got in the paper in London. And he wrote articles against Keach. And, artic and uh, uh, Keach wrote articles against him. And they went back and forth with papers and pamphlets fighting their different views. Hymns in the church, no hymns in the church. We shouldn't have hymns, we should have hymns. And they went back and forth. Guess who won? I'd say Robert Keach won, wouldn't you? You got a hymn book. Thank God for Robert Keach. Who can see into the future? Who can see the hymns were a good thing? And we have them. And you know what happened on the tales of this man, Robert Keach? And by the way, hymns were accepted as a practice of singing in the church, the Baptist church in 1700. Then God blessed the Baptist church with some great hymn writers, Isaac Watts. 1674 to 1748, Charles Wesley, 1708 to 1788, John Newton, 1725 to 1807, great hymn writers. When I survey the wondrous cross and all of those great things. Then, let's talk about Baptist people. The Baptist people felt a need for a hymnal. And the first Baptist hymnal was written in 1850. It was called the Baptist Psalmology. Had 1,295 songs in it. Other hymns started following. The Southern Baptist Convention published eight hymnals between 1923 and 1956. I told the Mark, I wish I had all eight of them up here. Stack them up here. Look at all eight of them. Because 
Some of you have a heart attack on picking which one I'm going to sing out of. That'd be a lot of fun to watch. I know that was. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going I'm to get back to my sermon. The hymnal, the hymnal that brought the greatest degree of unity to the, the, the Southern Baptist was the Broadman Hymnal in 1940. Then came the Baptist Hymnal in 1956, which included classical hymns and gospel songs. Then in 1975, there was another Baptist hymnal, which was yet broader in its scope, and it included youth folk culture songs. Then came the 1991 Baptist hymnal that we have here and we sing here in our church. And in that hymnal, we embrace praise and worship music. What we sing today in the hymnal as traditional was one time contemporary. One of the contemporary songs that Tess and I, we were in the youth choir. I was in a traveling youth choir, Brother Keith, believe it or not. A traveling youth choir. Why? My wife, my girlfriend was in the traveling youth choir, and I signed up for the job. I'm going to be in the traveling youth choir, too. I'm in the traveling youth choir, amen. And we're going to go, and we're going to sing. And one of the songs we sang that was a contemporary song was, There's Just Something About That Name, back in the 70s. Bill Gaither had just, I'm dating myself, right? Uh, Bill Gaither had just written that song. Guess what? Page 177 in your old-time traditional hymn book. See, we grunt and we strain over things that folks we don't think through. Let me just say for some of you having a hard time with praise and worship music versus contemporary music, let me just tell you something. Think about what your, what your, what your, what your basis is. Is it your preference? Is it your opinion? Is it your feelings? Is it biblical? Let me give you a good illustration. This goes in every area of church life. The Lord gave me this last week and it really touched my life. Never Here's the thought, Brother Keith. Never untie, excuse me, never cut something you can untie. When I played basketball, I had a friend of mine who, who could, he, he, his shoes were always in a tank. He played, wore converses. You know, don't slip inside, wear the shoe of the star on the side. Wore converses. <laughs> you missed that, didn't you? And, and he always get his, his shoelaces all tangled up. And he, he was so impatient, he'd just take his scissors and cut the knots off. And the shoestring got shorter and shorter. And therefore, less and less loops got tied. And he would just cut them in time. And some folks live their Christian life like that. You don't take the time to untie things. You just cut them. Because you're impatient. You cut relationships. You cut church memberships. You just move. You just leave. Why? Things get a little complicated. And you don't want to take the time to untie them. Untie this issue. Untie it, think through this issue of hymns versus praise and worship courses. Let me give you a couple of things. i got to hurry. Martin Luther, who's one of our great hymn writers, took secular melodies of that day that everyone was singing. They called them uh, chorales. And they emphasized, or he emphasized, secular tunes for worship. Luther said, why should the devil have all the good tunes? And he took some of them and put them in the hymnal and we sing them. A mighty fortress is our God. I love that song. You know what that was? That was a contemporary music of that day. I love to sing that song and so do you. Charles and John Wesley who wrote very many hymns like Oh for a Thousand songs, Tongues to Sing and Oh Can It Be. Those uh, were rejected by traditionalists of that day. You know why? They said those songs, that music comes from the beer gardens of Europe. And it did. He heard people singing those tunes in, in jails. He heard them singing those tunes uh, on the roadside. He took those tunes and he equipped them with Christian music, Christian words, and he sang them. Now, you know what I was thinking this week? All of these psalms in the songbook, 150 psalms, are lyrics. If God wanted the music preserved, he could have preserved that too. But maybe he knew that each generation would put their own music to these lyrics and sing them to the glory of God. And that's why he didn't preserve the music. Isaac Watts, who's the father of hymnology, wrote Joy to the World, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. He helped lead the church out of just singing strictly from the Psalms, and that was radical stuff in that day. He took tunes and melody from folk music of that day and put that music with his lyrics. In America, old Appalachian folk tunes found their way into the church. Samuel Stennett, you may not know his name, he wrote, On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land. That was an American folk tune, and the church of that day was repulsed 
by it. Now, young people, let me just tell you my heart. I've got to hurry because I want I Brother Martin to say a few words. I love hymns. I'm going to continue to sing hymns. This church is going to continue to sing hymns. Brother Mark loves hymns. You'll hear that in just a moment. We're not against hymns. We've been accused. Some people say, well, they're just trying to get rid of all the hymns. Don't want to sing no more hymns. That's not true. We love hymns. I was raised singing hymns. I learned about the blood, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ from hymns. Hymns have a doctrinal, theological basis. I love hymns. Listen, I buried my mama singing hymns. You buried your loved ones singing hymns. Hymns are part of who you are. And there's a precious generation of people in this church who love hymns. And I love hymns. And we're for hymns. We're, do, we're not trying to get rid of hymns. We're going to sing just like the Bible says, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It doesn't have to be either or, folks. It can be blended. It can be all of them. Yeah. It can be every single one of them. And that's what our desire is. That's what our prayer is. You say, well, I think hymns are outdated. Hymns are, 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 are need to be discarded. No, they don't be. They, need, they just need to be brought over and trained into a new generation. We can sing them for the glory of God. Can you imagine at Christmas time not singing Silent Night or Oh Come All You Faithful or Joy to the World or Oh Holy Night? They were all written 100 to 300 years ago. In contemporary churches by contemporary artists, they are saying. Now, let's talk about spiritual songs for a second. Spiritual songs it literally means, listen to this, ode to the breath. What that means is it's a song that's spontaneously saying from your heart to the Lord. Now, let me give you three reasons I think praise and worship music is really great. Number one, it's straight out of the Bible. Most praise and worship courses are written right out of the Bible. Second reason is it's the language that our young people understand. And the purpose of our church is to exalt Jesus, equip saints, and evangelize sinners. Do you know that Time Magazine said there are 38 million Generation Xers, Boomers, and Busters? 35 million of them have never been to church, not even one time. Music is their language. They make their decisions based on music, their priorities, their behavior, right and wrong, their lifestyles based on music. And they don't have a lot of confidence, unfortunately, in the church because church leaders have failed so often. They ain't got any confidence in the government, too much messed up in politics. And there's a 60% divorce rate in the home. And they're looking for someone they can put hope and confidence and trust in. And do you know that most praise courses are saying directly to the Lord? Hymns are about theology and doctrine, and hymns are testimonial, like from Seeking Sand. He lifted me testimony, but praise and worship, 90% of them are saying directly to the Lord. And young people are singing to the Lord with confidence, with vigor, with trust and confidence and hope because they're looking to the Lord. And by the way, worship is to the Lord, so it wouldn't make sense to sing to the Lord. Amen? Only like one out of 40 hymns in the hymn book is a song that's sung to the Lord. So I'm telling you reasons that we should never reject praise and worship music. Number one, it's sang, sung directly to the Lord. Number two, it comes straight from the Bible. Number three, young people are attracted and touched by that, and we want them to be helped and blessed. Singing from the hymnal won't make you more spiritual than singing from a screen. Singing with no music won't make you more spiritual than singing with music. It's not about loud or soft. It's not about standing or sitting. It's not about drums or organ. It's not about new or old. It's not about robes or pants. It's about your heart. We're living in an ego-centered all about me world. Somehow, some of us have prematurely died and made ourselves deity. And if we don't sing just what we want and just what we think, everybody's wrong. Who died and made you God? Who died and made me God? It's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's about reaching people with the gospel. It's about a variety. It's about diversity. And, 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 and. So we sing that way. 
I'm sure I am glad that we don't ride in horse and buggies anymore. I'm glad I don't have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the outhouse to use the bathroom. Some of you may do that. I'm glad I don't have to do that. I'm glad I got a computer and a calculator. And somehow we want to step back in the 1800s when we come to church. Folks, that doesn't attract or reach the new generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know some of you are upset because you had to get rid of cassettes and get CDs. Out with VHS, in with DVD. Times change. People change. And we change. This book never changes, and the preaching of this book never changes, but style and preference do change. You say, I don't think I can handle that. Preacher, sure you can. Sure you can. You'll be all right. Just hang in there. Be real in your worship. Let God move in your heart. Help you. Amen. So we can be diverse in our worship styles, can't we? We come from different backgrounds. I'm getting done. Different economic levels, different taste. Let me come up real close. Let me tell you this one last thing, and I'm going to be done. I promise you. Music is not what unifies us. We all got different taste in music. Music is not what unifies us. The Lord Jesus Christ, by his precious blood and by this book, is what unifies us. Young people, you can sing hymns. Can't you? This means yes, this means no. Cases give me the thumbs up. We like him, in. And some of you old people can, older people, <laughs> the Lord help me. I'm in that category. I'm in that category. I like him, so okay, I already said that. No, don't, don't get mad at me. Listen, you ought to be up here trying this, all right? I'm on pins and needles. I'm a cat on a hot tin roof. You ought to be up here trying this. I'm trying my best to be politically correct in all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm grading myself as I move along. I think I'm doing all right, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe I'm get, getting an L as far as you're concerned. But it's not, what, it's not what unifies us. Music is the Lord Jesus Christ. And man, you know what? You're going to get in trouble in every area of your life when it's always just about you. Now, I don't want to be mean or ugly to anybody, but I'm going to say this to you. Some of you, you go to a church a little while. Man, you love the preacher. You love the music. Everything's hunky dory. and the honeymoon's over. And you realize he's not perfect, they're not perfect, and you move to the next church. They sang a few songs you didn't like, they did a few things you didn't like, so you knew you move to the next church. One, two, three, four, five. Some of you have been five, six times around the block. Maybe it's time that you just settle down and realize it's not everybody else. Maybe it's just me that needs to swallow my pride and sit still and let God minister and work in my life. Always about me. Now, I want Brother Mark to come, and I want him to take a few minutes and just share some things on his heart. And he's going to sing a little bit and testify a little bit. And so come on, Brother Mark, and just do that. And then and when you get done, I'll, I'll close this out and we'll have our invitation time. I'm going to go to the piano because I'm comfortable here. <laughs> I wish I could speak like Brother Eddie. I watched a movie last night, uh, Aquila and the Bee. And, and, uh, she got a coach to help her learn her words, and he noticed that when she pat her leg, she could really remember, and uh, so he went and got her jump rope, and that's how she studied her words, and, and while I'm sharing that with you, you're thinking, why in the world is he telling us that? <laughs> that's why I'm here. Uh, I, I love to praise the Lord. I love to sing about Him and, and to Him, and I was thinking about this song. I love to praise Him. I love to praise the Lord. Well, I love to praise Him. I love to praise the Lord. Well, I love to praise Him. I love to praise the Lord. praise him <laughs> and uh, I like that hymn that or that that scripture that says I will sing to the Lord all of my life and I will sing praises to him and that's my desire and um, as brother Eddie spoke you know there's all styles of music tonight and some like 
jazz music and some like classical music and some like uh, contemporary and some like southern gospel and f- opera and bluegrass and some people like bluegrass and won't even tell anybody that they like <laughs> but I like good music is what I like I like I like God's music and and uh, I told my wife, I told Lisa when, when she married me, honey, I can't explain it. God just made me this way, and I've got to sing for him. And, and um, I remember when I was about five years old, I'd go to my grandma's house, and she had an old upright piano. And my dad had a family of 12, and, and, and man, we were all squished in there. He squished a good word. <laughs> and couldn't move around. And my cousins would be outside playing ball and, and I'd find myself at the piano and, and playing tunes and I didn't know how I was doing it. I, I was just doing it. And, and music has always been important to me and music has always spoke to my heart. And um, I started playing for my mom in church about the age of seven or eight and we'd sing together and it wasn't long till we'd start going to different churches and revivals and 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 singing and playing music and about the time I was 12 years old I began to play the piano for my church and I there in the I wrote a song about that little white church out in the middle of the woods and the church where I met Lisa and, and uh, I played the piano there for years and years probably Till I was about um, my early 30s. And uh, I, the church I grew up in, we were very, very traditional, very old-fashioned, I guess. We're foot-washing, shouting Baptist. And, and uh, they didn't think any instrument should be in the church except the piano. They didn't even allow an organ to be in the piano. And, and you know, there I was growing up, and I wanted... Uh, I wanted instruments. I wanted stringed instruments. I wanted the guitars and the drums and the bass and the trumpets. And, and uh, oh, we couldn't do that. We couldn't clap our hands. We couldn't stand up. And, and I'd sit there. I just contained, you know. <laughs> I just wanted to clap my hands and stand up and shout and, and praise the Lord and and I'd look over there, and there'd be that old deacon. We'd be singing. He'd be patting on the on the a pew. And I'd begin to think, well, why can you pat on the pew? Why can you pat your foot? But you can't clap your hands. When God's holy word says to clap your hands, to lift your hands up high. And uh, so we we worked on that, and um, we um, decided to have a singing. And we invited our first gospel group to our church. And we were downstairs having chili. And boy, now remember, I'm just, I'm just the piano player. Here comes one of the deacons. Now, you better get upstairs right now. He said, uh, I won't say the guy's name, but he is mad. They've got drums and guitars up there. You better take care of this. I'm thinking, I'm just the piano player. But I made my way up there, and there he was on the back seat. He had his arms crossed, and he was mad. Mm. I said, what's wrong, brother? You've brought those devil instruments in this place. I said, brother, do you know that God's word says to praise him with stringed instruments and cymbals, high-sounding cymbals? He said, it does? I said, it does, and I know your heart. I said, why don't you go outside and and walk this off and think about what you said tonight. And he, uh, next week, his wife, his wife sung every Sunday. Next Sunday, and of course, she would never ask us to play the piano for her. Here she came, Brother Mark, would you play the piano for me today? (laughs) And what a thrill that was. I guess I'm sharing that to tell you that my journey in music, um, I've grown in, in my journey in worship. It was about the time I was about 30, the Lord called me to lead worship at, at uh, Oak Grove Baptist Church. 
Now, that was uh, uh, quite different for me because um, they, all they sang, well, no, that's not true. They sung hymns, but most all, most of it was praise and worship songs. I'd go, our church didn't have church on Sunday night, so we'd go visit there. And many times I wouldn't know a song that they sung all night long. And I learned a lesson from that church that, that we should always do something that somebody knows if they come to church so they can sing along with us. So they asked me to, to lead worship in their church. Wow. I had to learn a lot of songs. Because we sung out of the old inspiration book. We didn't sing out of the Baptist hymn, though. We sung, I'll meet you in the morning by the bright riverside. Or I've got a mansion just over the hillside. And so I grew a lot in my worship there. I began to listen to those praise and worship songs. And I began to learn that they were prayers to God but we were just singing them and they begin to touch my heart so I guess what I'm sharing with you tonight is I've walked this journey and I've learned a lot about music and 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 my convictions about music I love the old hymns and as I said we're going to keep singing the old hymns and I love the praise songs and we're going to keep singing the praise songs we're just going to keep singing good songs about Jesus and to Jesus here. And I want you to continue to join in and worship and uh, just love the Lord as we gather together. I want to share just a couple of songs with you tonight. Here's a song. uh, Brother Eddie mentioned Fanny Crosby. And I uh, got thinking about her. I made a little screen. I want you to put that screen up there, if you would. Fanny Crosby. You'll notice all those titles. Those are songs that she wrote. And in her time... Uh, they didn't like her songs either. They thought they were too contemporary. And um, but she wrote some beautiful songs. She was blind by the age of uh, six weeks by an accident that happened to her. And uh, she said that she uh, wouldn't change her life because uh, from her disability, she grew closer to the Lord. She wrote a song called Rescue the Perishing. And she said that one night she was speaking in Cincinnati and she just felt like there was someone in the crowd that needed the Lord. So she said, she spoke and she said, I think that there's a young man here tonight who has strayed from his mother's way, from his mother's teaching. And she said, if you could, if you could come and meet me after the services, I'd love to share with you about Jesus. Of course, after the service... A young man came up to her and he said, ma'am, I'm that boy you're talking about. And she led him to the Lord that night. And when she went home, she said all she could think about was rescue the perishing. And God gave her this song. And we're going to sing a couple of verses of that. Rescue the perishing. Let's sing that. Rescue the perishing. was reading about another lady last night and uh, she had married her husband and they had moved away from home and her husband was in school and family wasn't close by and they lived in a trailer by a busy highway. They had a little baby and she couldn't even go outside and take the baby out in a stroller. She just felt alone and, and stuck and she said that uh, 
she used to get her guitar out and she would play and sing to the Lord every morning as she read her Bible. And one day she told the Lord, she said, Lord, I'm empty today. And she said, if I, if I have a song to sing, you're going to have to give it to me. And she said, these words came to her. I love you, Lord. And I said years later she went to a convention to speak and her husband and her came in late that night to the motel room and they heard a baby crying so she stepped down the hall and found the room where the baby was crying and she said she just wanted to whisper a prayer for that mother that young mother and for that baby and she said she heard that mother singing a lullaby and she said as she stood there all of a sudden the mother changed and started singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And she said it wasn't but just a few seconds that the baby quit crying. She said oh, that was such a blessing to her heart. Let's stand together and sing that one more time. I love you. Jesus Christ as your Savior. Tonight will be a great night to give your heart to the Lord. If you're here and you need to join this church, it's where God wants you to be and you need to make this your church home. While we're singing this hymn one more time, I want to ask you to step out and to come tonight. If the Lord spoke, spoke to your heart and touched you and you need to make a decision for the Lord tonight, while we're singing this hymn again, you step out and you come. For the Mark lead us, let's sing together. tonight has been a lot of information maybe for you to absorb but I, I do believe that God has met with us and spoken to us tonight and 
there's some areas in your life that need to be untied instead of uncut, why don't you ask the Lord to help you to untie those things and work those things out in your heart tonight that you can just desire to honor God, glorify God, and worship God from the depths of your heart. It's an issue of the heart. And tonight, if your heart's not right with Jesus, don't leave. You ain't got to leave this building with your heart in sin and with your heart cold. You can make things right with God tonight in your life. Don't let anything keep you tonight from getting right with the Lord Jesus, being saved or getting right with the Lord if you are saved. Don't use anything as an excuse for laying out of church and being away from the Lord. Just say, God, it's me. I need you to touch me. I need you to help me tonight. I need to get right with you tonight. And do that right there in that pew tonight. your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about. 